So today's session is on account administration. And then I'm also going to talk a bit about uh, public processes, which are right here on the dashboard screen. And then we're going to end with our process of the week. Um, and I'm also going to do a few demonstrations on um, using the process of the week, how to um, use that in your control panel and also in the management area. So to access account administration, you're going to go to the way top of your screen where this little wheel icon is. So all the way to the top corner, if I click on this little wheel icon, then I'm going to get three options here. One is to go to uh, user accounts, which is where we're going to go. The second option takes you to account settings, which we're also going to talk about, and then upgrade account. So let's start by going to user accounts. So what the user accounts is is the place inside of Touchstone where you create users for your system. So a user is an employee that will be using Touchstone or a subcontractor. So anyone, any person that you want to give access to Touchstone where they can access processes, um, they get access to a dashboard. So any employee that you have or subcontractor who you want to be using Touchstone um, setting them up in um, account administration is what you want to do. So when you create users in account administration, you're giving them their own usernames and passwords. So here you'll see an example. Here's Mike Brown. This is his username. When you give them individual usernames and passwords, it allows them to log in to Touchstone um, and the information that they enter and use and also their access restrictions is according to this username and password. So when Mike logs in, he's going to be able to see and do everything that I've allowed him to see and do. We don't care if you create a user called everyone at everyone.com and have everyone logging in out of it. So you can do that all day long if you want. The problem with that is that you can't restrict individuals' access so that, that everyone username and password is going to see everything that you have you know, given that particular username and password ability to see and do. So you lose that um, access control when you give out a general username and password to multiple people. Another thing that you lose is the dashboard functionality. Because I'm the manager of marketing and sales here, and when I log into my dashboard, I see all my processes, and then when I go to those processes and I complete things like checklists and forms and mark things as complete, it saves it all unique to me. And because I'm the one with that username and password, I'm the only one who can see what I've done inside of Touchstone. If there are multiple people logging in with this username and password, when they go to the control panel, they're going to see what I did, and they're going to be able to edit and change it and write over it if they want to. So you kind of lose the benefit of this functionality. You also lose the management area because you can see people's individual names here. So if we had five people logging in as Bill for the appointment setter position, and they were all putting information into Touchstone, and I, as their manager, were putting in notes for everyone, it's just going to be cluttered with everyone's information, and you lose that autonomy. All right, so that's my two cents on that. So to create a user, you go here where it says New User, and then the first question you're asked is, what's the user type? Administrators me give that person the ability to access and do everything in Touchstone. So administrators have access to everything and can do everything in Touchstone, including deleting everything, editing everything. The only thing administrators don't have access to that only the key account holder does, which is always designated with this yellow key, is they don't have the ability to go to account settings, and they don't have the ability to go to upgrade the account. Other than that, they can do everything in Touchstone, including editing people's passwords, deleting users. So I'm making this point because you want to be careful who you make an administrator. You want it to be 
you know, a top level employee. Um, you want it to be your touchstone power user. If you have a person in your company who's um, the one writing the processes for other people. So you want to think through and really make sure that your administrators are trusted employees that know what they can and can't do in Touchstone. So you choose the user type, and then you put in a, a user name. You want this to be um, a email address, if possible, a real email address. This one clearly isn't, but you want it to be a real email address because if that user or employee forgets their password, they can go through the password recovery on the home screen and it will email a temporary password to that username, which is supposed to be a, a real email address. So um, try to make these real. Now they don't have to be, like I'm gonna be able to add this one just fine and it won't give me a problem, but you do lose that ability for people to recover their passwords. Then you're gonna put in a password, type it twice, it's gonna tell you if it's not the same. Um, and then the first name, and the last name are the only other required fields. You can go through and put people's addresses and zip codes and their hire date and their position title and all that if you want to, but these are not required fields. So when I filled in the user information, I hit create user, and then now you see that user in alphabetical order by last name right here on the user list. So super easy to add a user. If I wanna to go to the details of that user, or what we call the profile, I can select it, I can always choose it from here as well, but I can select their name. And I know I'm on this user because now it's in this yellow color or orange. Once I'm on this user, I can do anything to the information. Um, I can go and make this person an administrator now. I hit update at the bottom, and now you'll see they're an administrator. If you've made someone an administrator and you, based on what I've said, want to now make them a user, you can, again, flip it. I can change the username right here. I can edit the first and last name. And then here's the password fields down at the bottom. Anybody who's an administrator can go in at any time and update anybody's password down here. Under, under user settings um, for employees who aren't administrators and don't have access to account administration, if they go to user settings right here, they're going to be able to see their email address or their username and also their password. So they can update it here as well. But you as the administrator can overwrite that, that password. So if they change their password for whatever reason and you want to know what it is you, and they're not telling you or whatever the situation is, you can always go and edit it here. Or more importantly, if someone has forgotten their password um, and they can't, don't know how to recover it for whatever reason, you can go and edit and change it here. So that's adding a user. To delete users, it's pretty straightforward also. You go right where it says delete user. And then I'm gonna see a drop down here. And then I would go to the user that I wanna delete. And then I hit delete right here. And then that user is gone. The important thing to remember about deleting users is if somebody is over here, in a, a user that you have on your user list, an employee, is here um, filling out things in a control panel, saving forms, saving checklists, saving uploaded files, whatever it is, if you delete that user, then you're gonna lose that information. So if you wanna keep that information for whatever reason, you can go to it and go to that completed checklist and then you can print it, which exports it to a PDF. So think about that before you go and delete users. Do you care if that information is gone? Um, do you want to, you know, do you want to save it? So let's go back here. So the profile screen again, or button again, takes you to the profile of the position, which is this information to the username and first name, last name details of that user. The next thing I want to cover is user access. So once you've created a user, like we just did this one, you then want to decide what kind of access to Touchstone you're going to give that user. So make sure you're on the right user, and I always know I am because it's highlighted here in, in orange. Then I'm going to go here and click that user access button. And now what I'm looking at is my organization chart from Touchstone. You're going to see your organization chart here in simple view, in this outline view. So how Touchstone gives access to users, to employees, is by position on the org chart. So when you give them access to that position, 
it gives them access to all the processes on that job description. So just so it's super clear, here's the org chart. If I want to give my new user access to customer service, I'm then giving that person access to all these processes that are on this job description. So that's what it means. Whatever's on this job description is what they're going to have access to and nothing else. So we we'll choose this person again, go here to user access. Now to give the person access, I choose the position I want to give them access to. And then I'm asked what type of access do they do I want them to have. Read only basically means just that. They can only read what's there. So all the processes on this customer service job description, they'll be able to read those. They'll be able to click on them, go to the work plans, the checklist, everything inside of them, and they can read what's there and print it. Edit access means they can edit, can edit what's there. So they can go to those processes, they can edit the titles of them, they can edit the work plans that are already there. They can edit the tasks that are already there. Create access is the highest level of access aside from being an administrator. And if you give create access, that means that they can, again, go to this customer service job description. They can obviously read it and they can also edit it. But in addition to that, they can create new things on it. So they can add a process to it. Um, they can go to the process and they can add a work plan or a checklist. So create access allows them to create new things for their position. But here again, only for this position, only for customer service. So let's give this new user create access and then hit update. So now we're going to see that he has or she has create access because this position is illuminated in blue, which lets me know it's create right here. You can also give, it, it's it, it's probably good methodology to think, okay, what does this user do in the company? What positions do they fill? And then give them access to those positions, clearly. If they fill multiple positions, then give them access to multiple positions. So if the customer service person was also the appointment setter, I would select this, and I'm just gonna choose a different level so you can see the different colors, and then hit update. So now they've got create access to customer service and now edit access to appointment center. So give them access to number one, the positions that they fill. Then also give them access to positions that they might fill in for. So if the um, sales assistant is out for a week on vacation, then this person needs to fill in for the sales assistant. So then I would want to give them access to that position, and it would probably just be read access, which means they can't edit or change anything here. They're just going to be able to access and, and look at what the sales assistant does so that they can fill in for them. If a position is a manager, then it's prob it makes sense that they would have access to all the positions um, in their department. So if I'm the manager of marketing and sales, I probably would need create access because managers, their job is to manage with processes, to update processes, to make sure they're efficient. That's part of the, one of the biggest benefits of a manager, especially when you have a system like Touchstone and you're striving to have a process dependent business. The managers are key in that. They manage the processes. So I'd give them access to that person access to their position, and then you'll see Touchstone automatically defaults and gives them the same level of access to the positions underneath them. And it does that because they're the manager and they need to be reviewing, editing, updating all the processes for these positions underneath them. That's their job as a manager. Now, you, if you wanted to, you could go in and change this access. Um, I don't think that you ever would, but if you want to, you could go and change this to read only or whatever you want it to be. Um, but by default, because they're the manager, they should have access to all the positions underneath them and create access at that. I'm just going to remove this for now. You can also remove access like I just did. So now let's log in here as this user. I'm going to copy this. 
I'm going to log out. And then a login as this particular user. I hope that's the password. Yep. So this is what it looks like when I log in as this user we just gave access to. If we go to the org chart, you'll notice all these boxes are grayed out because I don't have access to those positions. These are the three positions that I was given access to. So when I click on customer support, I was given create access. So I can add a new process right here. I can go to a process on my job description. Oops, sorry. So I can go to a process on my job description and then I can click any content that's in it and I can edit and change this. I can also go and add a work plan or add any tools. So this is what create access looks like. Um, I think we gave edit access to this one. So you'll notice this, this toolbar functionality has gone up here. I can't add new processes to this. I can just edit what's there. There's no work plans in this, but if there were, I could just edit what actual content was in that work plan. And then I think we gave read access to the, for the sales assistant. So here they can print using this if they want to. And if they go to the process, as you notice, all of this functionality is gone because all they can do is read what's there. They can't edit or change anything. If we go to the four functions list, they'll be able to see what's here in gray, but they can only access these processes because they're on one of those job descriptions that they have access to. And even though they may have selected it from here, I know that they've got create access for the customer service position, and so they'll have create access to these processes. But any of the other processes that are on the job description that they only have read access to, when they select them, they'll only be able to read them. So that's what it looks like. So I'm just going to log out here and then go back in as me. And then we'll go back up here to account administration. So that's the user access. If I go to an administrator like myself here, and I go to user access, you're going to get this error message. It's not an error, but it's just a message. It's saying there's no reason for you to give access to this person because they have access to everything. So if you see this when you go to user access, look over here. And if you didn't mean to make this person an administrator, then go and change it. Um, okay, so let's talk about these. Before we get to control panel, let's talk about these settings up here. This button will always take you to the user accounts. This button here will take you to the user settings or account settings. Only the key account holder can access the account settings. Under account settings, you'll see your business name up here and your address if it's been populated. You'll also see down here below um, the, these functions, which allow you to, to create a design or a color or a feel to your touchstone account. So the header color is white in this one, and this is my header color. If I wanted to change the header color, I just select the box itself. I choose the color I want to change it to, and then I just hit update. So now it's this blue color. The text color is what's over here, these icons here. So if I go here to the text color, then I can choose a different color for that and hit update, same idea, and then it's going to change this text color. So that's pretty straightforward. You can also upload your logo. So you see our logo right here. If you have your own company logo, um, you can go to choose file. You find your logo that you've saved. And then you hit update, and then the logo will appear. There are buttons down here which, if checked, will display the default color, display the logo, or display company name. So I'm just going to update all these so you see what they are. The default colors are this green color here. So if you're customizing your header and your footer color and it's still green, it's because you have this check box checked. So if I uncheck it and hit update, then it goes to the colors I've selected. Also, the company name field is populated from this right here. So you'll see the word touched on right there because that's what the, the company name is. 
if you have a logo that has your company name in it, like ours does here, then you can uncheck this if you don't want it to be look redundant. But if you have a logo that's just an image and you want your company name to appear, then you put it here. Um, I saw the other day someone put their business name and put, I can't remember what it was, but it was some kind of funny thing like, you know, use Touchstone every day or something like that into this business name field. And then it just popped up here on the screen, which is was kind of cute. So this field controls what is seen here in the company name field. Once you've uploaded a logo, make sure this box is checked. I'm just going to uncheck it so you see. See now, I have my logo is still uploaded, but I don't see it because it's I haven't had this button that's I haven't put in this button that says display logo update. If you don't have a logo file or something like that, you can always go to um, your website. Like here's our website, um, and you can using Jing or whatever screen capture tool you have, you can go here and like. Uh, take a snippet of your logo like that, and then save it. Ah, I'm capturing a video. Save it, and then save it down to your desktop, and then go back to Touchstone and upload that logo. So that's a quick way you can get a logo in. The, the logos and the look and feel are important because when, when people log into Touchstone and they're looking at it, they um, it makes it feel like it belongs to you. It's not some foreign software that people are using. It's actually you know your tool. Okay, upgrade account. So this allows you to get more users. Um, every account comes with 10 users now um, for free as part of your basic subscription. Um, we just have yet to update this, uh, but you do have 10 users. If you want to upgrade your users from there, some of our resellers we offer unlimited um, users to. So you may not know that you were referred by someone else, but if you are and you are and you want to upgrade your users, always contact us and say, hey, what what is my deal for users? Um, at minimum, we give like really heavy discounts for users because we want you to be able to have your employees accessing processes and using them. It's absolutely critical to the success of your processes. So if paying more is an issue for you, then make sure you contact us and see what we can do for you, either giving you free users because you're um, part of a, a resale network or um, just giving you a discount. Okay, so let's go back to user accounts. So here on the dashboard, when you first log into Touchstone, when you're assigned a control panel, it appears right here. So I've got this control panel for manager of marketing and sales. The control panels are assigned and managed here in account settings. I'm sorry, user accounts. So if I choose my name on the list here, and then I go to control panel, you'll see I have a managerial assignment for manager marketing and sales. I'm going to click this and just remove it and hit update. Now this is what it looks like when there's no assignment. So if you log in and this is what you see, and you're like, how do I use the dashboard? Well, it's because you don't have a control panel assigned or your employees don't have control panels assigned. So here in user accounts, click the name of the user on the user list, then go to control panel, and then choose the control panel or the position you want to give that user a control panel for. So here it is exclusively the position they fill. It's the work they do. So choose the position. Then you're asked, is this a managerial position or is it not? Is it staff? If it's a managerial position, this explains to you right here that they will be given management review for the positions underneath them. So here on the organization chart, if I'm given a control panel for president and I'm given a managerial control panel, I'm going to have management review for all these people underneath me. I'll be able to see everything. If I'm given a control panel for this position, sales and marketing manager, I'm going to be able to see every position underneath me. So let's go back here to account administration. Oops. I'll choose my name on the user list. Go to control panel. Choose manager marketing and sales. Make it a manager position and hit update. 
Now you see I have a control panel for this position. And if we go back here to the dashboard, here that control panel appears. So that's how you assign control panels. In addition, you see I've got management review for the positions underneath me. So for each user on the user list, once you've created them, go through and assign control panels. Assign the control panels for the positions that they fill on the org chart. You can assign multiple control panels to a position. So if I go back here to control panel, let's say that I'm the chairman of the board and the president and the manager of marketing and sales. And this might be this way because when you build a future organization chart, like we've talked about in the past, you can actually um, be filling multiple boxes or your employees can be filling multiple boxes on the org chart until the time that they would go and um, you would go and actually hire a position to replace them in that, in that role. So if I go here to board of directors, I can give myself a control panel for this position. And then I go president, and I give myself a control panel for this position. Now I've got three control panels. And if I go back here to the dashboard, you'll see all three of these positions. How this can be useful to set up this way is when you're filling multiple boxes um, or in any growing busy company, people ha are wearing different hats. And that can be overwhelming and stressful. How this helps is it kind of allows you to see your work broken down by position so you can prioritize it and you can kind of wear that hat. Um, I used to work for Michael Gerber about 15 years ago. It's been a long time now, but right out of college, I went to work for him. And at that time, EMIS was, you know, brand new almost. And we used to have business owners come in to EMIS to actually build their processes. Um, for those of you who don't know, Michael Gerber wrote a book called The E-Myth Revisited, which stands for the entrepreneurial myth, which basically means most small business owners out there aren't necessarily entrepreneurs. They're more technicians or, business, or people who knew how to do something and started a business doing that. So we would bring people in and they, we would have hats that they would wear. And on one side it said strategic and on the other side it said tactical, technician, manager. And so we'd sit them down on the desk and have them flip their hat around. So it was just like a, um, it was an indicator or a, like a ceremonial thing where it said, okay, now you need to flip gears. Now you're a manager. Now you're the entrepreneur. Now let's think about that work. So this isn't exactly the same thing, but it ha kind of has the same effect. Like I can look at this and say, what do I need to do today as the manager of marketing and sales? What do I need to do today as the entrepreneur, as the shareholder of this business? What do I need to do today as president? Or I can say, what do I need to do? I'm going to do president one day a week. So I come in on that Monday and then boom, I'm right here. And I look at my work and I'm like, this is what I need to do. And I start focusing on it. I work on the budget. I work on the strategic plan. And then, you know, maybe every afternoon, every, every day of the week, I'm the manager of marketing and sales. So I click here and I'm like, okay, this is what I need to be doing. I need to on, do onboarding for my new employees. Um, I need to do help them with sales follow-up. I need to do the marketing indicators. So think about that with control panels. It kind of helps for time management and also kind of your efficiency, really. Okay, so let's go back here to user accounts. So, so first step, add your users if you haven't done that already. Um, go and assign user access to the, those users. Decide what level of access you want them to have. Think about the particular person. So Mike here, think, is he going to help build the processes? Is he, does he have the ability and the knowledge to go in and edit things and change them in touchstone? If he does, then give him create access. If he's not that type of a position and you just, he needs to just be following what is, then give him read access. Then go and assign control panels for those positions. 
So assign all the control panels for every user on the user list. Think about the position they fill. What box do they fill on the org chart? And then fill that position in. Um, I want to show you one little technique here. And I'm just going to remove these control panels so we can start fresh. If some of you have positions on your org chart um, like this, where you've got the apprentice, the lead, and the senior. And I'm going to go to the org chart just to show that a little bit better. So you've got like a, a growth plan. Start here, move here, move here. Inside of Touchstone, this person may not necessarily manage this person. Or these people or person may not necessarily manage this one or this one. So inside of... Um, when you're assigning control panels, you can go to the position, go to control panel, and if I choose um, my senior tech here, so I'm giving him a control panel, I can choose staff instead of manager and hit update. Now he will have a control panel, but he doesn't see management review for these people because he's not really their manager. This is just showing he may, you know, help them out on occasion, but he's not really their manager. This person is. So that's just a technique to kind of remove the management review area for boxes underneath the org chart um, when the position above isn't really the manager. Okay. So I'm going to go back here and give myself back a control panel so we can use it for example purposes. Date. So let's go back to the dashboard here. So here um, in the dashboard, you have this section here called public processes. So that's this whole area right here. And for those of you who have been in the other webinars, you've heard me say before that, um, this, that these processes are meant to be company-wide information. So they're not the accountability of one or two people on the org chart, two positions. They're not on anyone's job descriptions. They're company-wide. They're public information, as we call it, company-wide information, stuff everybody needs to access and use. So reserve your public processes for that um, because then what it becomes is kind of like a repository of all of this critical information that all employees need to have access to. It becomes a great place for HR type processes where maybe in the past the managers are getting bugged for forms and where's this and how do I take a vacation and I can't find my employee handbook or whatever it is. Um, you can put all that information here into Touchstone and make it public. And then the next time people need that information, you can say, go back to, um, go to, the, go to Touchstone, log in, go to the public processes. So to make a process public, just as a quick reminder, you go to that process on the four functions, li functions list, click it, and then fill in this box here, process, make process public and available to all users. Then if I go back to the dashboard here, I'm going to see that process now in the public folder. You can also remove it just as easily. So if we go back here to this process, I can uncheck it, and now it is out of the public folder, and I go back to the dashboard. Now it's gone. Once you've put something in the public folder, um, then, and it appears here in this, on the dashboard, you can reorder these just by moving them up and moving them down, processes. If you've got, you know, 25 processes here. I was in an account the other day and they had like 40 processes in the public area. That's kind of a sign that maybe you've put too many in here and that maybe some of those processes are really the accountability of a particular people or a department, not necessarily the whole company. Um, so if you've got a lot of public processes, think about that. Are they really public? Should they really be here? When I select a public process like this one, Employee Handbook, it opens it in the control panel view. So what that means is it can be accessed here. I can read it, I can print it, but I can't edit or change it here. The only way I'd be able to edit and change a public process is to have the right access to it and then be able to go here to the four functions and to the process tools page and actually edit and change it. So here, 
if I want to just look at the employee work rules, I can view them. And here they are. Or if I have an employee handbook that's an uploaded file, they can access it here. Or if there's a policy related to the employee handbook, they can access it. With the public processes, you managers can also use use the dashboard to help reinforce those processes. So if I have an employee who's not following the work rules and they went they we had gone over with them when they first started, but they're still not following them, I as the manager can say, hey, go to your dashboard. The handbook process is right there on the dashboard. Select the work rules, read them, go through them. Make me a note, read it, and agree, and then save it back to Touchstone. So what this does is it just reinforces it. If there's new work rules, you can have everyone in the company go and, and perform this action, and then you've got the date and the time that they actually read them and agreed to them. Then here in the dashboard, as that person's manager, I can go to them through management review, and in addition to seeing all of their processes from their job description, I also see these public processes. So within here, I can go and look or run a report on the fact that they reviewed and agreed to the work rules. So inside a management review, for every position that you have management review for, you'll be able to see anything, any content they added and anything that they did in their, with their public processes. Um, here's another example of that. If someone wants to take a vacation, they go, I'm logged in as me here. I can go to the vacation request form. Now I'm filling this out for myself. My username and password is the only one who can see this or access it. And then I go down here to a custom form. And then I can fill out this form with my name, personal, vacation, reasons. And then when I save it, it saves it back to Touchstone. And then my manager over here in the reports tool can run a report of all the time off and vacation requests for that month or that week. And then that person will get a list of these things. So because the process is public, it's available to everyone, but it can be accessed by that individual user and completed. All right, any questions about public processes? Um, if someone's asking about, uh, uh, I think you're just asking about resource materials. So, um, and I've made this comment before and suggested it to, to different people about having um, resource materials, I'm just calling it. So it would be like processes that um, are uh, related to maybe your products and services that you offer. Um, maybe they're um, priceless, um, just kind of company-wide information that educates the employees on the types of services and products that you actually deliver. So yes, I think that that would be a great public process. Um, and they're asking even though it might just be related to sales. Well, I mean, I think that's a judgment call. So let me fill out the question a little bit more for everyone else. Um, if you have uh, a, a price list or um, resource materials on products and services that the salespeople generally use and have to be trained in. You can create a process in Touchstone and call it sales resource materials and then put all those price lists and all that product information and links to videos and whatever else you have inside of that one process and then just link it to all these people's job description. So that's one way. Um, if it expands cross company, like information on information on products and services, I don't think that's half bad for these people to know that and have access to it, and even the finance admin people. So if it spans across the company and it's useful information for everyone, then make it a public process for sure. Um, all right, so let's talk about the process of the week. This is um, a good process for every business to have. A lot of businesses don't, but I think it's really essential and it's called new employee onboarding. So this is a relatively new process to our library. If you're an older Touchstone user, um, like let's say more than a year, 
then you may want to go back and, and find this process because we send emails out about it, but sometimes those get missed, but you may not have this one and it's a good one to have. So what the, the value of new employee onboarding is, is it helps you to take a new employee and bring them into your company in a clear, specific, thorough way. So here's some statistics that I found on new employee onboarding. 22% of new employee turnover occurs within the first 45 days. So what that reads to me is within the first 45 days, you have to make a good impression on your employees. You spend a lot of time to recruit and hire them, to bring them in. And if the company isn't exciting to them, if it isn't organized, if it, if they're not brought into the company in, a, in an excellent way, then they'll quit, 22% of them quit within the first 45 days. Bad training is another reason for that, not just onboarding. 4% never return up to the first day of on the job. Wow. So employees coming in, the first day is horrible, unorganized, there's no onboarding, there's nothing clear and consistent, they don't know what they're doing, they quit. In the first six months, new employees make a decision about whether or not to stay. This is my favorite. The cost of losing an employee in the first year is one and a half to three times their annual salary. Anybody who thinks that's not true, really rethink it. Look on the internet. Read more statistics. There's plenty out there. Analyze it for yourself. One and a half to three times their annual salary. You know why that is? It's first of all learning by the tribal method of training where it's like, look over my shoulder and I'll teach you. That costs a hell of a lot of money. It's also from all the money it costs for you to recruit and hire, money you put into training if you do, um, inefficiencies that's gained by the rest of the department having to deal with um, the training of a new employee when you don't have good processes. The cost of losing an employee in the first year, one and a half to three times. Crazy. So this is just um, motivation for starting to think about how, what you can do as a business to really prepare for a new employee to come on board and to make their first day training excellent and thorough. Put your best foot forward. Analyze things after 30 days and 60 days. Ask them how they're doing. Put them through a process where they know that it is its attention is being paid to how they're brought into the company. So this new employee onboarding process has got some work plans in it, which go through kind of a step-by-step -step for how to prepare for a new employee. So this is kind of what you would do before they come. Call them, confirm their date and start time. All of this can be edited and changed. So if you're more, you know, if your company is different and you wouldn't, you know, do it exactly this way, just edit and change it. I think sometimes people look at the library processes and their first reaction is, oh, this is too detailed for us, or no, we don't do it this way, rather than looking at it and saying, well, how can I edit this and really make it work for me? Um, choose to make it work for you because you know you need an onboarding process. If you don't know you need that, then we need to talk, but you do. So create some version of this that works for you. Um, add them to the regularly scheduled meetings that are occurring. Prepare their calendar for the first two weeks. The first two weeks for any employee needs to be training, training, training. Job description training. Go to Touchstone. Train them in each process on their job description. So set that up in their calendar. Plan their first assignment. What's the first thing they're going to do? Ready? Uh, read and study their job descriptions. Email everyone else out in the company and tell them about the new hire, what their start date is, what their role is, so that when people can greet them and say, hey, you know, you know I heard you just got hired. So go through um, a step-by-step -step clear getting ready for the employee to come so you're organized and together. The more efficient you are with this, the more efficient they're going to be and the quicker they're going to come up to speed. Then work on some kind of first-day training process. Training process. Go through the HR stuff, like the new employee introduction, which is like giving them their employee handbook and going over that with them. Sometimes in, in bigger companies, you may have an HR person who does all of this. Um, in smaller companies, the managers do it. So this becomes a managerial process that the manager needs to do. And they need to know they need to do it. <laughs> they can't just like have the employees show up. There needs to be some preparation. So what's the first day training going to look like? Um, then after 30 days, so 
preparing for, you know, what ha- what's going to happen and what you're going to go through after the first 30 days. Elicit feedback from the employee and be available to answer questions. And then 60 days. Hopefully they've stayed past 60 days. They get a 60-day performance review. This is also in the library inside of Guiding the Business for you to access and use. There, by 60 days, they should be well into their job description training, which is that going through every process on their job description, going through it, and being trained. Have an onboarding to-dos checklist like this one. Edit this and make it your own. So this holds the manager or the HR person accountable for making sure each of these steps was followed. Um, Have a first day training checklist. Here's an example of one of those. So what's the first thing they're going to, the manager will check these off as they've done them just to make sure that they're following through on each of the key things they need to do to make sure that that employee feels welcome. You know, we talk a lot about how bad hires cost a lot of money. Um, I just want to point out that if you do a great job with your recruiting and hiring and you bring on a really great employee and they feel like your business is playing a game they want to play um, and you spent all that time and money, if you don't do a good job with the onboarding, then you've wasted all that time and money. So it goes both ways. You can have a really good hire and blow it because the training isn't good enough, your, your onboarding isn't good enough, or you can have a a hired a bad employee, and that costs you as well. Managers are key to this. Um, the, in all my years in business, oftentimes employees quit because of their managers. And it's because the managers aren't managing well, or they're just not, they don't communicate well, their style is not good. So managers need to be trained in how to do things according to the way that you want them to do them. And this new employee onboarding is is about that. It's about really being able to maybe see a manager who's not following this and really help to train them more or decide they don't really have the good a, a good attitude or the best attitude to be a manager. So Checklist examples are here. Um, There's frequently asked questions that you can build out. This is just a placeholder for it. What are frequently asked questions for new employees? What are things that they typically ask and how would you answer those things? Um, There's a custom form for this process as well. So this is a form that can be filled out by the manager, um, putting in the employee's name. And I'm gonna show you how this actually gets filled out. They checking off these boxes as they did them. What happens after 30 days, 60 days, comments and concerns. Um, There's videos, welcome to the company video, how to speak with a new employee. This welcome to the company video can be a great thing for employees to sit and listen to and watch. So think about your onboarding. How do you want it to go? Not only the technical aspects of it, of like getting them their employee handbook and doing their payroll paperwork, but the actual quality of it. Um, how do you want them to feel? How do you how do you want your company to be represented? So this is new employee onboarding. So let's go to the dashboard here and run through just an example of this. So I'm the manager of marketing and sales. I have a new salesperson starting, and I'm going to go through new employee onboarding with them. So I'd log into Touchstone. I go to my dashboard. I can even have it open on my phone if I want to. I click this new employee onboarding process. Probably the first thing that I would do is go right down here to the the checklist and start filling it out as I did the work. If I can't really remember what's supposed to happen, what I'm supposed to do, I can go look at these work plans just to remind myself. We don't do onboarding every day. So you can maybe in a smaller company, you might hire once a year or twice a year at most. So it's not... um, it's not reasonable to think that I would remember all of the steps of how to onboard correctly when I did it six months ago. So this is yet another reason why Touchstone is is fabulous because I don't have to try to remember or I don't have to sift through um, network files trying to find the last thing I did six months ago. It's all here right in Touchstone. So I'd go to the checklist Um, and I'm getting ready for the to-dos of this employee and checking them off as I do them. I put in the employee's name right here. I can put any notes about things I want to remember or something I didn't 
couldn't exactly do the way I needed to, I go and check off these boxes as I do them and then save it. Then I go back to the second checklist, first day training. So I look at this before their first day, go through all these things. Then at, at the end of the day or throughout the day as I'm doing them, I check off that I did them. Check off that you did these things. Did you go through and introduce that person to everyone? Did you take them out to lunch? Did you review their job description and their outline and their expectations? Do all that at the end of first day. Put in this person's name again, and then I save it back to Touchstone. This may take me, I mean, doing this can take a whole day, but then filling out the checklist stating that I did it is not that much time, but it's worth kind of the, the pushing someone through the step-by-step -step of it. Then the employee's onboarded, they're working for the first few months to get to the end of the 30 days. I might go down to this um, onboarding form. I can put in their name here again. I can also put it in the save as. I prepared for them, first day training done. I did the 30 days, now we're waiting for the 60. 30 day review notes, I can put the notes in as to what I did after the 30 days, then I save it. We're not to 60 days yet, so I leave this blank. Then when 60 days hits for that new employee, I'm back in my control panel. I go down to that custom form again. I go here to the completed folder. There it is for, for Sam. I click it and now I can fill out the rest. I did the 60 days. He's been doing his job description training. Go down and put note, more notes. Put in any comments and concerns that he's raised to me or that I have of him. And then I save it again. So having something like this done for every new employee is phenomenal. It makes sure that they're thoroughly being onboarded in the best way possible. I've got lots of notes about concerns I have, things he's doing well, things I want to talk to him about from the 30-day review that, are fall, that fall through to the 60-day review. And it's all here in Touchstone, you know, easy for me to find. Furthermore. My manager, so I'm the manager of marketing and sales, my manager up here, the president, might be wondering, how is she doing with training all her employees and getting them onboarded correctly? Or maybe Sam quits and says, this place sucks, or I didn't like this. And the president's like, what? We just spent all this money recruiting and hiring this guy. Why did he quit? They can go and then look at the work that I did for the onboarding, the things that I said, um, and see the exact reasons why, or make sure that I did it thoroughly. So I'm gonna log in, or I am logged in right here as the president. So this is another Touchstone account that I've just called up, and I'm logged right in here as the president. The president could go down to me right here and look and see that I've been doing that work, or what I did, or they can simply go here and run a report under management review, go down here under user and look for me and hit run. I'm gonna give it a date range because there's probably a lot there. And then find that employee form that I filled out. So here's all the onboarding stuff. The first day training done at this date and time, onboarding to do's, did those, did those. Here's that onboarding form. So with two clicks, they can go in to me, to, uh, into my control panel, and see that I've actually done all this for Sam. So the benefit of this whole management area right here inside of Touchstone, which we're logged into now right here, is that the manager can see without having to ask me, can go in and look and see that I've been doing things thoroughly.